My name is Sam Vaknin and I am the author of Malignant Self Love, Narcissism Revisited. In February 2008, I granted an interview to Barry Zellan of Intersec in the United Kingdom. Barry asked, since the end of the Cold War, what has been the role of private contractors in the conduct of war? Has it been on the rise? My answer? Private contracting of military function has been on the rise since the first Gulf War in 1991. With the collapse of the USSR, the militaries of the main Western protagonists, the USA and the UK, have been drastically scaled back, a process known as the peace dividend. At the same time, economists and politicians throughout the world embarked on an ambitious plan involving the privatization of state-owned firms and functions. Inevitably, the two fads coalesced and huge chunks of hitherto state-monopolized warfare were contracted out, outsourced, or in uh, some cases, offshore. Barry, what have been the primary functions for contractors in war zones and how has this aided the war effort to states? My answer? Third world countries have always leveraged mercenaries to subdue, to subdue adversaries at home and abroad. Many armies in Africa, and Asia, and even in certain parts of Europe, such as the Balkans, were or are being run by third party contractors who sometimes also actively participate in the fighting. As far as the USA and UK are concerned, until the Iraq war, Private contractors were mainly responsible for logistics, secure, uh, uh, training, and security tasks. But this narrow definition of the role of private con contractors is in flux. Private soldiers of fortune may yet be hired and rented out even by the governments of the West, though I admit that I find this possibility extremely unlikely. Barry asked, with the demise of the USSR and the end of bipolarity in international affairs, most of the wars have been, to some degree, asymmetrical contests between unequal adversaries. Do private contractors help states sustain their warfighting efforts during asymmetrical, protracted and low-intensity conflicts, when a full military mobilization is politically and or economically unfeasible? How would you describe the current role of private contractors in GWOT, Global War on Terror Operations. The numbers appear to be large, perhaps over 100,000 contractors in Iraq alone. What does this tell us about the transformation of war? My answer? Though it would make eminent sense, I am not aware of such a role. Granted, private military companies are involved in the provision of logistical training and security support to forces on the ground and they also collaborate with field agents of secret services, such as the CIA. But asymmetrical warfare is still carried out largely by regular armies, backed by intelligence, gathered by state-run agencies. Actual combat is not being transformed by the influx of private contractors. We are simply reverting to earlier times and models when war was a public-private partnership, and military camps incorporated entrepreneurial suppliers, contractors, service providers, and hangers-on. The attempt to render modern armies self-sufficient and self-sustaining has clearly failed. Barry asked about then um, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld. He says, part of Secretary Rumsfeld's transformation program was a trend toward a decreasing size of our armed forces and a continued shift toward superior technology to defeat the, defeat the enemy. Does the increasing role of contractors enable defense organizations to shift their resources on the higher tech functions, effectively outsourcing the lesser skilled functions? Is, a pro is the privatization of the warfighting functions consistent with the transformation and the revolution in mil military affairs as we shift towards leaner, higher tech armed forces? No, I answered not in my view. Lean, Technology-rich armies are an inevitable outcome of budgetary constraints and ever more sophisticated gadgetry. The transformation program is a response to these trends, not to the changing face of war. Truth be told, the USA has always faced low-intensity, asymmetrical warfare. It rarely found itself engaged in conventional battles, mainly in the European theater. Private contractors merely substitute for existing structures. 
their functions are not always low skilled, quite the contrary. Moreover, the army duplicates the functions of private contractors. This redundancy may appear wasteful, but it stems from the deep and justified distrust professional soldiers hold toward civilian contractors. Barry. Looking ahead to the future, will we see an even more prominent role of private companies in future wars? My response, quantitatively, yes, but not qualitatively. Private military companies and private contractors will grow in number, stature, and contribution to the war effort. But they are unlikely to replace the professional soldier in actual combat or the field and agent in human, human intelligence. Their functions will remain largely limited to logistical support in training. Barry, what does this private-public partnership mean in terms of the ability of states to engage in multiple engagements at once without general mobilization? Is an outsourcing model smart economics? And what about the political and diplomatic implications? Are there dangers of the perception of too great a role of private contractors in the conduct of war and potential problems with the chain of command? Back to the GWOT, War on Terror, and its emphasis on low-intensity conflict, counter-terrorist and counter-insurgent operations, and preemptive strikes against rogue states and non-state actors, does the role of private contractors complement the war aims of the coalition of states aligned in the long war against terrorism? My response. Private contractors are not GIs. They provide no substitute for the fighting men and women of the armed services. I doubt if they ever will. Thus, they do not alter the military equation in any meaningful way. Their involvement has no bearing on whether to draft and mobilize fighting age conscripts or not. Incredibly, there are no serious studies that decide the question of whether private contracting is a clever move from the pecuniary point of view. Anecdotal evidence suggests that it is not, and that waste and corruption are as rife there as among the traditional state bureaucracy. Chain of command issues are inevitable. This is especially true when contractors are granted immunity to the consequences of their delinquency, crime, waste and venality. There is no love lost between the fighting corps and private contractors. As we have seen in Iraq, the involvement of PMCs, private military companies, is often resented by host governments and leads to diplomatic and other incidents. The solution, of course, is to hold private contractors accountable for their actions and misdeeds. But this is politically awkward. Barry, I was thinking about how Xenophon and many of the battle-hardened Greek warriors hired themselves out to the Persians in an effort to foster regime change there two and a half millennia ago, resulting in his infamous March of the 10,000 back to Greece after the effort failed. It seems that there has been a very long history of private entities participating in warfare. Lots of military theorists have examined the topic, Machiavelli for instance. I am curious as to your thoughts on this long history. In some ways it seems like an old phenomenon. But then again, something seems new as well. With Napoleon's levé en masse transforming the conduct of modern warfare, resulting in the emergence of total war, and later a series of world wars, I'm wondering, does the recent trend towards privatization suggest a return to the classical roots of war seen in ancient and early modern days, and shift away from total war towards more limited engagements? Or might this be a temporary uh, phenomenon until a new peer adversary such as China rises to shift things back to mass warfare. My response. <clears throat> the modern armies that emerged after the Crimean War are a historic aberration. With the exception of the last 150 years, armed forces throughout history were composed of professional soldiers for hire, augmented admittedly by ad hoc short-term bodies of conscript conscripted vassals or citizenry or militias. The erstwhile fighting corpus in its camp incorporated hordes of suppliers of goods and services, private contractors in today's parlance. The attempt to render modern armies self-sufficient and self-sustaining by getting rid of these par parasites has clearly failed. We are back to where we started, the traditional army, professional corps surrounded by private suppliers. It is also completely wrong to postulate the total war is a modern phenomenon. It is at least as old as the Bible. 
The ancient Hebrews were instructed by God to eradicate their enemies, men, women, and children, and to confiscate the property of the vanquished foes. How more total can it get? Mankind is always cycling between geographically limited guerrilla-type skirmishes and all-out warfare. Top-heavy Goliath uh, forces, armed with the latest technologies, always faced pebble-slinging, nimble, low-intensity Davids. There's nothing new about this. We're simply in an interim period between two classical types of war. Call it a respite.